Good evening, everyone. And thank you for attending tonight's webinar. My name is Jason Fisher. I'm a member of the SIR RFS Communications Committee and a current intern in surgery at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Uh, tonight, we're really excited to have a presentation on IVC filters, placement and retrieval by Dr. Chick and Srinivasa, who have been with us a number of times. Um, I want to give our usual disclaimers quickly before we begin. One, this session will be recorded uh, and then placed subsequently on the IR Education YouTube channel, so you can feel free to check it out along with dozens of others there uh, at your pleasure. And second, if you have questions, I think we're going to try and keep it pretty interactive and get them answered as soon as possible, but you'll note the questions chat box on your GoToWebinar control panel here. Uh, typing them out there is the best place to do so as they come up um, throughout the presentation. That way, myself or Jacob Bundy, who'll be moderating tonight also, uh, can go ahead and stop our presenters and get your question answered. And if it doesn't sound like there's a, a good time to do so, we'll be able to save them for the end that way. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Jacob, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so everyone, I'm Jake Bundy. I'm a surgery intern at the University of Michigan. I want to thank everyone for coming here tonight to listen to Drs. Chick and Dr. Srinivasa talk to us about IVC filters. They're going to be talking to us about some of the basic placement um, guidelines as well as some more of the retrieval techniques and some of the more advanced retrieval techniques that go into it nowadays. Um, Dr. Chick is a staff physician at INOVA. Alexandria and uh, Dr. Ravi Srinivasa is an associate professor at UCLA. They, they've been with us for a while and done a couple of these talks already, so they're pretty well versed with this. Uh, like Jason said, any questions you have along the way, just type them in and I'll try to respond to those and find a good time to interrupt the presenters and try to get those questions addressed to make the talk more interactive. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Chick so he can begin the talk. All right. Uh, thanks, Jake, and thanks, everyone, for having us again. Uh, tonight, Ravi and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, inferior vena cava filter placement and retrieval as well. As you guys know, uh, this is a huge topic. Uh, you could probably talk several hours on placement and retrieval itself. So we sort of limited this to some of the basic, uh, some of the basic, basic placement techniques as well as some of the basic and a couple of the advanced retrieval techniques. So please interrupt us with anything. Uh, we're both going to talk and kind of uh, do this together. And here we go. Uh, so obviously, there are, as usual, there are a few people that we'd like to thank. Uh, Joe Gemetti, who we've worked on several projects with at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's taught us several of these techniques. And Ravi and I both have to thank Scott Trertola and Bill Stavropoulos at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who both trained us. Uh, taught us a lot of the filter placement techniques as well as the advanced techniques uh, specifically regarding the endobronchial forceps uh, where they were used uh, predominantly there. Uh, so overall tonight our goals, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the background, how filters were designed, why they came about in the first place. We'll talk about the reason for using them. Uh, the specific indications, specifically with regard to the SIR guidelines. We'll talk about uh, relative and contraindications to placing these filters. We'll talk about the so-called temporary filters or the previously called permanent filters, although nowadays many of these can be removed if, if necessary. We'll go over the basic placement techniques. Uh, we'll talk about filter-associated complications. And finally, we'll show you a couple uh, retrieval techniques and some cases. So uh, how did the whole idea of inferior vena cava filters even develop? Uh, so historically, way back when, uh, before IVC filters were developed, uh, the whole idea was to develop some sort of way to protect the body from developing pulmonary emboli uh, from blood clots or deep venous thrombosis in the lower extremities. So there were a whole host of different ways that people thought of, uh, predominantly surgically ligating different veins. Uh, that was either the femoral veins or the ligating the IVC itself surgically. Uh, there was also a device designed uh, called a Dewey's clip, uh, which was essentially a little metal clip that went across the IVC or uh, any vessel in particular. And this would essentially surgically close off uh, 
or ligate the uh, vein and prevent the blood clots from migrating. As time went on, uh, there were a variety of surgically developed uh, filters or cone type devices that were made. Uh, the Mobin Uden was uh, one placed in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, which we'll show some pictures of in a second. And uh, it's basically like a little metal disc uh, that was implanted and again could collect blood clots. Uh, these sort of progressed to different filter types. Uh, one of the first was a Greenfield filter, which was actually developed in Michigan at the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, besides filters, there are a bunch of other techniques, uh, such as occlusion balloons, which we'll show some examples of. And then finally, filters is where we are today uh, with regard to endovascular techniques. So... These are a couple examples here that uh, Ravi found if my mouse works. Uh, so this is an example right here of the Dewey's clip, uh, which is a device that essentially goes over the inferior vena cava or clips, uh, surgically ligates a vessel. Again, the theory is it would prevent blood clots from the lower extremities from migrating to the uh, upper extremities or the lungs themselves. This is one of those uh, occlusion balloons called the Hunter Sessions balloon. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Ravi, this was sort of a trivial question online on the SIR Connect one day, and Ravi was the one to figure this out. When a lot of people across the country uh, were wondering what this was, a uh, patient had one, and uh, a lot of people tried to figure out what it was ultimately, and Ravi figured that out. Uh, and this is the Mobin Uden right here, um, which is sort of a surgically placed metal disc, uh, which is kind of one of the uh, early IVC filters, so to speak. Looking at these things, it's like crazy that you would think that occluding the cava makes a whole lot of sense completely. Uh, and, you know, the Mobin Uden was kind of an iteration of it where they have like fenestrations in the actual filter. So they were starting to think that, yeah, maybe, maybe we should create a device that actually allows flow through the cava and not completely occlude the vena cava entirely. So I, I think that was the first start of the, you know, the idea that you could create a device to trap clot without actually occluding flow entirely. Want to keep going or me? No, no, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, so ultimately, as Robbie said, uh, the you sort of started with those first ideas, the Mobinudin or some sort of device that could trap some blood clots, but allow some normal blood through. So the whole idea with inferior vena cava is developed. So the idea in general was to provide some sort of either temporary or long-term prote protection against those blood clots developing yeah. the legs and then migrating to the lungs. But at the same time, uh, these devices had to keep the inferior vena cava open. Uh, they couldn't, uh, it couldn't be a total blockage and couldn't result in obstruction because somehow, obviously, the blood from the lower extremities had to reach, uh, return to the heart. Uh, so they couldn't occlude the cava altogether. And they needed to be something that would be long term and durable uh, with sort of few complications. So this sort of led to the development of our modern inferior vena cava filters. Uh, as you know, uh, they work pretty well, uh, but they're certainly not without their complications, and uh, we'll talk about some of those later. Let's see if that goes forward. So this was the original study uh, that sort of was the foundation uh, for inferior vena cava filters in general. And if you look at it, it's a little bit shoddy and hard to believe that this is uh, some of the foundation for why we use them today. So if anyone ever asks about uh, inferior vena cavas and uh, various studies, uh, the one study that you should definitely know is the prefix study or the prefix study. Uh, it's a study that was in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it looked at 400 patients who had deep venous thrombosis and these patients were had cardiopulmonary compromise uh, or were at high risk for developing pulmonary emboli. Interestingly enough, uh, these patients were all on anticoagulation, which is sort of a not the standard play today. Uh, 
because most of the filters that we place are in patients who can't be anticoagulated. So this is a little counterintuitive, uh, but it was a start. And so uh, the group was separated into 200 that received an inferior vena cava and 200 that did not receive a filter. So the outcome was they looked at pulmonary emboli at only 12 days after the placement. So again, it's not a very uh, long time. And if you look at the numbers even, only two patients in the filter group developed uh, pulmonary emboli and eight patients in the non-filter filter group uh, develop pulmonary emboli. So it's 4.5% versus 1%, uh, and this was deemed to be statistically significant. So this is actually the foundation of why we use a lot of the filters today. And overall, the uh, study concluded that in patients who are on anticoagulation, uh, the addition of adding inferior vena cava led to a, only a 4% uh, risk reduction in pulmonary embolism. So the overall true effect of a filter is relatively low. And the evidence today is actually not that sound for using them. In fact, uh, sort of even more interestingly was, as you can predict a little bit, as you placed IVC filters and it led to some degree of obstruction, it actually resulted in higher rates of proximal deep venous thrombosis. Uh, which we see today with filters that cause cable thrombosis and everything, which we'll talk about later. Uh, so it's kind of strange. It's a little bit paradoxical. We have, uh, obviously, they help a little bit with prevent pulmonary emboli, but they also uh, cause deep venous thrombosis. And this is sort of the foundation. And so actually today, uh, the Society of Interventional Radiology and the Society of Vascular Surgery are performing uh, performing a much larger study uh, to look at all types of inferior vena cavas across multiple institutions. Uh, I think enrollment is coming close to being finished now. And uh, the goal is to determine if these are truly beneficial uh, to patients here. Keep going, Ravi, or? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Or whatever uh, you want. Oh, yeah. No, I don't. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about the indications for things. Uh, so we have absolute indications for inferior vena cava filters and uh, relative indications. Now there are SIR, uh, Society of Interventional Radiology guidelines, as well as guidelines from the chest physicians. Uh, they're similar to one another. Uh, they vary slightly, but uh, here we have at least the SIR guidelines since it's in accordance with our society. Um, so there are a lot of strange situations or uh, nuances or unique situations, but in general, these are the main things that we kind of look for. Uh, so an inferior vena cava is certainly indicated in a patient that has some sort of venous thromboembolism or deep venous thrombosis in general. They have to have that or they should have that. And some reason that they can't be on anticoagulation to present, uh, prevent the blood clots from in theory, migrating to the lungs. So they may have some inability to be uh, anticoagulated. They might have an enzymatic deficiency. They might just themselves have poor compliance, but for some reason they can't uh, achieve successful anticoagulation. They might have typically uh, some sort of anti or contraindication to anticoagulation. This is one that we see quite often. Uh, these are sick, ill patients with multiple other illnesses. They may have some kind of cancer uh, that tends to lead to hemorrhage or gastrointestinal bleeding. And often uh, they're on some sort of anticoagulation that then has to be discontinued. Uh, so as a result, they have a deep venous thrombosis, but they can't truly be anticoagulated. So filters indicated in those situations. And that's one that we tend to see quite often. Uh, another one is uh, recurrent pulmonary embolism despite uh, being on anticoagulation. So we call that or we think of that as sort of a failure of anticoagulation. Uh, we don't know the exact reason. Uh, maybe again, just enzymatically, uh, the anticoagulant doesn't work that well or maybe they develop uh, pulmonary, uh, venous thrombosis in other areas that either overwhelm the filter or sneak by the filter or so forth or uh, sorry, uh, they develop this, with, they don't have a filter at this point, but they uh, develop 
uh, deep venous thrombosis somewhere else, uh, despite the fact, and they keep getting pulmonary emboli, despite the fact that they're actually anticoagulated. And that's another reason to put a filter in. Um, some patients, despite being on anticoagulation, their thrombus continues to develop. We often think of this in patients that have isolated lower extremity deep venous thrombosis, such as posterior tibial vein or popliteal vein uh, venous thrombosis, which is a fluid form reason to place an inferior vena, vena cava filter. But when they propagate up to the common femoral vein or iliac veins, uh, just when being on anticoagulation, that's a good reason to consider a filter. And finally is this thing called the Widowmaker, uh, which is a free floating thrombus, uh, which is like a loosely attached thrombus kind of sitting in the inferior vena cava. And we think of that as, uh, despite the fact that they're on anticoagulation, uh, this is a mobile thrombus that could break off any moment and potentially uh, result in death. Uh, so these are the sort of absolute indications that we think of. Uh, so relative indications for filter placement. Again, uh, these are patients that have some sort of venous thromboembolism uh, and, or some deep venous thrombosis, and they have some other criteria. Often people cite they have poor cardiopulmonary reserve. Uh, that's, they have uh, some sort of dyspnea, they have extensive emphysema, they have heart problems, they have heart failure, and the theory is that any additional burden on the heart and on the lungs could result in uh, significant morbidity. So uh, that is another reason to consider placing a filter. Uh, Anticoagulation compliance uh, is another one. Uh, this was particularly difficult sometimes with warfarin and uh, maintaining an INR that was therapeutic. Um, but with some of the new novel anticoagulants, this has become a little bit easier, but still it's, uh, it's difficult to take medication every day and some people certainly just can't do it. Um, if the thrombus is particularly extensive, um, and again, there is concern for migrating to the pulmonary arteries and causing substantial morbidity or mortality, that is another reason. And some folks place them uh, before uh, lysing or breaking up any blood clots in the lower extremities, because again, the thought is that uh, a large thrombus burden in the lower extremities could, uh, during lysis or during mechanical thrombectomy, they could break off, migrate, and move to the lungs uh, despite being on anticoagulation. So a filter would be helpful in those situations. Uh, some people place these uh, historically for trauma patients and uh, various patients for surgeries, uh, particularly bariatric surgeries, uh, because the thought is that after these surgeries or bariatric surgery, uh, patients will be immobile and uh, immobility in general will be a higher risk uh, for developing deep venous thrombosis and subsequently pulmonary emboli. So, what do we think of when we think of the contraindications? Uh, so in most, uh, most times, it's relatively easy to place these. And uh, there are a few situations where we don't place them if it's appropriate. Uh, certainly, one to consider would be an uncorrectable coagulopathy. Uh, these are folks that have liver disease or some sort of uh, reason that their INR cannot or cannot be lowered or their platelets, they have some sort of uh, platelet consumption disorder and basically it would be unsafe in theory uh, to place a filter. I personally haven't come across that. Uh, I think with some of the reversal agents we have today, you can almost always correct someone's coagulopathy, but it is in theory a problem. Another one is poor venous access. So we can place these filters a variety of ways. Uh, we'll show those later. Uh, but if all venous access routes are occluded in theory, there's no good way to place one. But now we have devices that can come from a jugular, can come from a brachial, can come from an uh, inferior venous kit, or can come from a femoral approach, can come from a popliteal approach. So it's pretty rare that you can't find some sort of access to place these filters. But something to consider for uh, an actual contraindication is caval occlusion. So there are certainly times uh, where patients have substantial thrombus burden, uh, 
uh, that extends all the way through the inferior vena cava. So there's no place to really land a filter. Uh, it's a whole bunch of thrombus and you can't put it above it. You can't put it below it. Uh, there's just no role for a filter really in those instances. Again, uh, some relative contraindications. Uh, again, a severe hypercoagulable state is again, sort of in my mind, more of a theoretic thing uh, that could exist. Some people are weary to place these uh, in adolescent preg uh, patients or uh, pregnant patients. Again, the theory here is that with adolescents, they tend to grow. Uh, their inferior vena cava chains tends to change in size. Uh, and you never really know. It could result in filter migration or filter fra uh, fracture or uh, so forth. It's the same reason we don't love to stent in patients who are younger. Uh, because you may size something for a younger patient, and then as they tend to grow, uh, they tend to outgrow that device, and you don't really know where it goes. Uh, the same thing with pregnancy. So as uh, a woman grows and is pregnant, uh, and it can crush the filter or the hemodynamics of blood flow change a little bit, uh, it's a little bit unpredictable. Uh, filters can be placed in pregnant uh, patients. Sometimes we place them uh, super renal, uh, just so that they're, they're a distance uh, from the growing fetus and it doesn't crush it or distort it or so forth. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. So, yeah, another thing I would add uh, to that too, I know there's some people who uh, think that, you know, in septic patients, you shouldn't necessarily place an IVC filter and maybe that's a relative contraindication, but I think there was a paper published back in 2003 showing that you, you can place them safely, and in some instances, it may be actually safer because the risk of them getting pulmonary emboli uh, and septic emboli may be worse than, than the risk of, you know, the filter potentially becoming colonized and infected. Um, but again, these filters are generally temporary. We're, we're trying to take out, you know, now there's filter registry, so we're really diligent about trying to get filters out. So I think I think that issue is, is, is not as uh, important as much anymore. Cool. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Ravi. I think that that is actually a question that has come up a couple times or uh, people have posted on SIR Connect about that issue and a patient that's bacteremic or a patient that's septic. Uh, what is the, is it safe to put a foreign body? Uh, you know, sometimes we're concerned about putting covered stents or so forth in patients that have known bacteremia. Uh, but this study, I believe it's in JBIR did show that it's safe. And as Robbie said, filters themselves are not, do not tend to be seeded or colonized uh, or anything, and it is safe. Uh, so we break uh, filters nowadays into temporary and permanent IBC filters. So temporary filters historically were those that would uh, stay in for a short amount of time. Uh, the patient had some sort of uh, DVT that or the patient was a surgical patient or had a DVT that would resolve with uh, time. And so the thought was the filter would be placed and then removed in the future. While permanent were filters that uh, in patients who say had uh, extensive uh, metastatic disease, had a hypercoagulable state uh, and probably didn't have that long to live, and uh, so this filter would probably remain in place for the rest of their life. So these were called permanent filters. Uh, the difference was uh, historically, or the easy way to tell, and we'll show a bunch of pictures, is temporary filters had hooks or, or have hooks. Uh, so that's how you always know what they look like. And permanent filters did not have some sort of any hook or any device to retrieve because they stayed in place. Uh, nowadays, this is a little bit um, antiquated uh, because a lot of permanent filters can, or all permanent filters in theory, can be removed. Uh, they shouldn't be removed just to remove them, but if they are complicated by fracture or complicated by cable, inferior vena cava, thrombosis, uh, or something that leads to extensive symptoms, they can actually be removed. So permanent is sort of maybe not the right word. So. Here are many of the temporary inferior vena cava filters that we have today. Uh, we have the Bar Denali, uh, the Gunther Tulip, and the Select Platinum. Uh, 
the Opti's, the Argon Option, the ALN, and the Volcano Crux. So uh, these are a little bit institution dependent. Uh, some institutions have many of them and others just have one. So a lot of it is just dependent upon referral patterns or industry or so forth, what has been stocked at a particular institution. Um, and that's why certain folks uh, use one or the other. Uh, but in general, they are pretty similar. So these are used in uh, patients who really only require some sort of temporary protection uh, against pulmonary embolism. And uh, in theory, they're only in for a short amount of time uh, and they're removed before any potential complication is caused. So here are just a couple examples. Uh, this is certainly always a uh, sort of a quiz thing that happens in residency or fellowship or so forth. Uh, people like to ask what kind of these filters are. And it's also something that's maybe not always taught. Uh, I think Ravi and I, this was certainly drilled into us uh, by Scott Tarotola, what every single filter was. Uh, but then nowadays, not everyone knows. Uh, people just call filters green. In Michigan, historically, everyone called every single thing a green field, even though it certainly wasn't a green field. So the first question is uh, how to know if it's temporary or permanent. So the obvious answer is with time when you know, always just look for the hook or some sort of uh, something that will, uh, something where you can retrieve it. It's how that tells you if it's permanent or temporary. So the, the, the Denali has uh, this characteristic look. Uh, it has a bunch of straight legs and then has these characteristic arms to the filter. Uh, so it has paired legs and paired arms. Um, there are certainly studies out there that show, some studies that show there's a high risk of fracture with these filters, uh, but historically, at least where Ravi and I trained, we placed many of them, and uh, I thought it was personally a very good filter. So this is one of the filters that's placed at many institutions. Uh, this is the Gunther Tulip filter. Uh, again, it is a retrievable filter because you can see the hookup here. Uh, and the way to identify this one is Tulip like a flower. It has these multiple metal petals. And sort of the uh, importance of kind of knowing what these filters look like is ultimately when they're retrieved, uh, it's important to look for all the fragments. So you got to have a good idea of what they actually look like and how many legs they have, how many arms they have, if they have pedals, if they have uh, large metal wires or these thin fragments, just so you know, uh, so you can account for everything when you retrieve the filters because retrieving things can certainly be traumatic and uh, it's easy to miss a small piece and not account for it. So this is the uh, select, the Cook Select filter. Again, a temporary filter because we have our hook here. And the characteristic part of this one is, I like to think of it as almost like an onion bulb. So the it has the legs again, uh, but then the center of it has these other arms or legs that are, they kind of, if you look at them all together, it looks like an onion bulb. So I always think this of this as the onion filter. I don't know why. Uh, that's kind of how I remember that. So we have a quick question here, if you have a second. Yeah. So someone is asking, how long should these temporary filters stay in, or what's the maximum duration that you should reasonably think to keep them in, whether it be one week, one month, et cetera? So uh, the sort of thought and the guidelines is they should be uh, removed when, as soon as they're no longer needed. Uh, that's kind of the sort of general answer. So it, you know, the earlier you get it out, the better, because one, the complications are reduced and two, they become a lot harder to remove as time goes on. So the earlier, the better, uh, the FDA has issued a statement, uh, 
similarly, that all filters should be removed as soon as they're no longer needed. Um, but that being said, uh, as all of you know, I'm sure, there are some of these that are retrieved a day after they're placed, and there are some that are placed 20 years after, uh, or some that are retrieved 20 years after placement. So they can be retrieved certainly at any point, uh, but the risk for complications increases, and if you don't really need it, why have it? So I guess the short answer is, as soon as it's really no longer needed, it's, it's not an emergency to remove it right away, but as soon as you can. All right, great, thanks for that. Yeah, so this is the Cordis Optis filter. So this is a filter that was historically placed uh, a few years ago, uh, and this is one of the notorious filters uh, that is notoriously difficult to get out. So uh, this is an Optis and its uh, brother, the Trapeze, which we'll show later. Uh, this has this basically characteristic appearance. So it has multiple uh, bars here uh, that then kind of funnel together on both ends. Uh, this is particularly difficult to remove because all these straight bars basically lay in contact with the inferior vena cava. So it has a very high surface area that's touching the inferior vena cava and it tends to develop neoentymal hyperplasia and uh, thrombus and all sorts of things. It tends to basically just grow into the wall. Uh, so historically or for a long time, uh, these weren't removed because they just were difficult to remove or they could cause complications. But with some of the newer techniques, these are removed now, but they can still be difficult. They can uh, require access from above and access from below. Sometimes you can get it out from just one side, but they can be difficult to get out. And a lot of people think these are associated with high rates of cable thrombosis because of the increased surface area. The one thing about the Optis that's interesting is that the hook is on the bottom, so it's on the femoral side. But as Jeff and I know, it doesn't it doesn't actually work that easily every time, and sometimes you have to grab it from above as well, even with the Optis variety, and as opposed to the Trapeze, where you usually have to grab it from two directions and over sheets from the IJ approach and a, an ephemeral approach. But even with the Optis, at times, you'll have to also grab it from the top, although the hook is at the bottom. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so this is one of the filters. This is the Argon Option uh, that a lot of people like placing today. Uh, this is interesting in uh, that it's cut from a single piece of stainless steel, uh, like uh, one piece. I'm not exactly sure how they do it, but it's a single piece here. Uh, so in theory, it comes out uh, more easily uh, as one piece. Uh, a lot of folks are placing these. And again, I do, it. It's hard to explain, I guess, its appearance, but it, it has these wide uh, sort of gaping sort of legs here that sort of uh, it has this sort of characteristic appearance. This is also one of the filters that uh, some of the folks at Mount Sinai have used uh, or have, have used for another retrieval technique unique to these where they grab it from below and do an inversion technique uh, to remove these. So it's an interesting filter and it's one that a lot of people are using today. Uh, this is the ALN, uh, not placed as often, but occasionally you see this, and it's it's nice when you see it and you can identify it. Uh, so the ALN has, again, uh, legs that look a little bit different if you've looked at them, if you're familiar with all these, but then it has this kind of center, very long leg, uh, which uh, is very characteristic and helps you identify this if you ever see it on a radiograph or you see it on a CT scan. Again, it's temporary because it has a hook on the top. The, the other important thing to know about the ALN is it's a, it's one of the stainless steel made filters as opposed to nitinol. And so when you're talking about doing these like filter inversion techniques, you probably shouldn't do it with an ALN. And you shouldn't do it with an ALN because you run the risk of tearing the cava because it's these are really rigid. And I've, I've retrieved a number of ALNs in one of my previous practices and um, they, they're, they're fine. And yet that extra, that long leg is actually designed to help center it in the lumen better. And it does work, um, and they're not terribly difficult to remove, but it's definitely one you don't want to flip a, flip this filter in the cava because you'll tear the cava. 
maybe people have done it successfully in the past, but but I I mean they're made out of stainless steel, so it's uh, it's a little dangerous. Perfect. Uh, this is a Crux filter again, which uh, has this characteristic look. I think it's kind of going out of favor. I'm not sure that anyone really places this today, uh, but occasionally people see one and retrieve it. Uh, I personally have not retrieved it now, isn't it, Jeff? I think it's off the market. The, yeah, the that's market. what I mean. Yeah, I don't think you. I don't think anyone places it, right? Yeah, I, I think it's off the market. I think it got taken off the market because of some lawsuit or something but yeah you definitely still see them for retrieval like you said yeah yeah you definitely see them occasionally for retrieval i've never retrieved one personally uh but i'm told they're not that difficult to retrieve either yeah. um they have hooks on both sides but it has this very very different look from all other IPC yeah. filters. it's designed to center itself and they claim it's a self-centering design so yeah there you go so those are the temporary filters that you'll see most of the time. Uh, so then we talk about permanent filters. So in theory, uh, permanent filters were designed for patients who would have these patients long term and they would never, ever be removed. Uh, and these patients would probably ultimate, ultimately expire with the filter. They were also designed to be, in theory, more durable. Uh, so that they would have fewer complications. They wouldn't fracture, uh, they wouldn't move, they would stay in place, they wouldn't thrombose the cava um, because they would be there forever. So uh, these are the typical ones that we think of when we think of permanent filters. Uh, the bird's nest filter is maybe the most well-known uh, permanent filter, and we'll talk about later a few indications of why to use that in particular. Uh, we have the Greenfield filter, uh, which would, again was a very well-known one that was designed in Michigan. Simon Knight and all, uh, which is very characteristic. The Venatec, which a lot of people use today, and the Trapeze, which is the uh, cousin to the Optis. Um, so yeah, this is the reason for placing them again to prevent pulmonary embolism, uh, keep flow, and hopefully not break or fracture. So this is the bird's nest filter. Uh, it's a very again, characteristic filter and uh, very unique compared to any other filters. Uh, so it's got two sort of V-shaped uh, inverted components. Uh, and then the center is basically just wire mesh. Uh, so it's kind of deployed in a weird fashion where you deploy one of the, uh, the triangular or V-shaped ends. Uh, then you basically deploy this mesh component in the center and then you put the other guy in. Most people nowadays uh, have not really placed any of these and you really don't see them. Uh, a lot of institutions have one on their shelf uh, because the important thing is this is really the only filter that can be placed in instances of mega cava uh, where the IVC is particularly large uh, or larger than 28 millimeters. Um, so this is the filter that in theory is used for that. Um, it's interesting, Ravi and I, I think both placed one of these in fellowship in a pig in a practice lab. Uh, it's certainly kind of difficult to place because it's not like the other ones that we're used to placing. And interestingly enough, uh, we're also involved in retrieval of these as well. Uh, and we have, uh, I think it's the first publication of the retrieval of these coming out uh, in a couple months with Kyle Cooper and John Moriarty, also at UCLA. So, uh, but you don't see them very often in reality. This is the uh, Greenfield filter, uh, which uh, is one of the major permanent filters. Again, very characteristic. Uh, you know that this is permanent again, because there is no real hook. Uh, there are a variety of different types of this. You have the stainless steel variety, the titanium variety, uh, which have slight nuances in the different appearances. But in general, all greenfields have these legs that are uh, these angulated legs. Um, and uh, again, uh, this was in theory meant to be one that could stay in place. Uh, but as time has gone on, uh, there's certainly been several instances of removing these. Uh, Ravi and I and some of our colleagues in Michigan removed a decent amount of these uh, 
uh, for instances of cable thrombosis. So folks are removing them. Uh, they can be a little harder to remove because the legs of them here have these sort of tines or hooks that almost uh, hook into the IVC. So a lot of times these guys are easier to remove with two sheaths uh, so that to close down and help you get these legs out. The thing about uh, it, one interesting thing about the Greenfield is it's probably one of the larger delivery systems to get it in. That's like 12 French, and then the the other the counterpart to that is the Option, which delivers through a five French system. So the Option Elite. Perfect. Uh, so this is the Simon Knight and all filter again. Not something that's really placed, but occasionally you see one. And this is kind of exciting whenever you see this because it sort of looks, it definitely looks different than anything else. Uh, it kind of looks like a spaceship. It has these like this upper kind of cone thing, uh, cone mesh basket, and then these legs at the bottom. Uh, again, this was designed uh, to be a permanent filter, not be removed. Uh, but again, uh, several of these have been removed too, or not not too many. There aren't any series, I don't think, but Robbie and I and a couple of our colleagues have removed a couple of these, um, hopefully to be published one day. Um, but it's an interesting looking filter, that's for sure. Uh, this is the Venatech filter. Uh, this is a permanent filter that's used a lot of times today. Uh, it stabilizes the, its legs kind of stabilize against the cable wall uh, and hold it in the center and hold it in place. Uh, again, it's a permanent filter, uh, but some of the folks in Chicago uh, have a couple uh, reports in JVIR of the actual retrieval techniques for removing this. So it can be removed as well if necessary. And then finally, uh, this is the cousin to the Optis, the Trapeze. Uh, which is very similar to the Optis, kind of these uh, straight straight arms, which are uh, body of the filter, which rests against the IVC. And uh, the difference here is there is no hook uh, like the Optis, uh, so it stays in place. And sort of a way to remember trapeze versus Optis. Uh, so Optis has an O because it's optional so it can be removed uh, where the trapeze is the permanent version of it and it has no hook. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to place these filters. Do you want to do this, Ravi? Or? Sure. Yeah, so uh, so the basics of placing a filter, so you can come from a variety of different approaches. So you can come from a neck approach, come from a jugular approach, or you can come from the groin. Um, you can come from the arm in theory as well. Um, or come from a popliteal approach, which we've done as well. Sometimes if you're doing DVT cases with the patient prone, you may uh, want to come from a popliteal approach and come from behind the knee and place the filter. Um, generally, you need to do a flush venogram in order to evaluate the cava, and you're looking for a variety of things, including vena cava diameter, um, the renal vein location, anatomic variants, and then any evidence of inferior vena cava thrombosis, um, and those are the things. Jeff, uh, I gotta I gotta take a page real quick. Let me okay. can you continue yeah. on. And yeah. I'm, I'm still going. in the hospital, yeah. so yeah, don't worry. Um, so as Robbie said, uh, these are the basic steps. Uh, so filters are relatively easy to place. Uh, the most common location is the internal jugular, and then after that is the femoral vein. Uh, but they can be placed by other ways as well. Uh, with longer delivery sheets. So the very first thing to do is you get access with the micropuncture set. Uh, you put in your mandrel. Um, then you put in that transitional dilator, which changes from the 018 to the 035 system. Uh, you then uh, put in an 035 wire, uh, such as a Benson, a floppy wire, or a more stiff wire, such as an Amplatz. And then you can use the delivery system with the filter initially, but it's easier or maybe more economical to use a flush catheter at first. So over that wire, you, you put a flush catheter down into iliac veins, and uh, then you do flush venography. And the whole point of that is to see if there's any abnormality or see if there's any uh, problem or reason not to place the filter. So when you do IVC venography, uh, you look for the diameter. Is it less than 28 millimeters where you can place most filters, or is it more than 28 uh, millimeters in diameter where you should place a bird's nest filter? Uh, you look for the locations of the renal veins because the theory is either to place it, the filter apex at the renal veins or below the renal, or one centimeter below the renal veins. 
there's no specific guidelines, but the thought is that maybe uh, placing the filter or the apex right at the renal veins, uh, the blood flow out of the renal veins uh, sort of bathes that material or bathes any thrombus in it, and it may help uh, dissolve it uh by being in that location i personally place it one centimeter below the renal veins i don't really i think just theoretically i maybe like to keep it away from the renal veins but the people do it very invariable things uh so it's important to look for anatomic variants because these will depend these can play a role in how you place your filters and uh the other thing is cable thrombosis because if the cave is totally thrombosed uh, you shouldn't really place a filter. So what abnormalities might you see? Um, so, all right, I guess this is, might be the wrong version. But uh, so uh, there, the things that we look for are a circumaortic left renal vein, a retro aortic left renal vein, azogous continuation, hemiazogous continuation, uh, duplication of the IBCs, or a ureter that goes around the cava. And I think, hopefully I have pictured, yeah, okay, good. So uh, in general, uh, when not looking at any of these variants, most filters, uh, the general rules are most filters should be placed below the renal veins. Um, in general, there may be an increased risk of thrombosis if they're placed in other places, uh, but this hasn't uh, borne out completely in studies. Uh, but the thought is the safest place to place them is in the inferior vena cava. Now, in general, if you see a duplicated inferior vena cava, it's smart to place two filters, one in each, uh, because if you only place one in one of them, it doesn't provide true protection against pulmonary embolism. Uh, considerations or reasons for placing a filter above the renal veins are in patients that are pregnancy, uh, in pregnant patients, so there's no compression or distortion of the filter. If you have some sort of thrombosis of the inferior vena cava so that uh, the filter is a place above that thrombus, if the thrombus extends above the renal veins, it should be placed above that in the suprarenal location. And uh, in theory, if a patient has an upper extremity deep venous thrombosis and poor cardiopulmonary reserve, you may place a super renal cave uh, filter or a filter in the superior vena cava, but most folks don't like to do this. Uh, most upper extremity deep venous thrombosis can just be managed with some sort of anticoagulation. And uh, most people are weary about placing uh, filters in the superior vena cava. It's close to the heart. They can be hard to remove. Uh, they can lead to a bunch of problems. So we tend not to do that unless we absolutely have to. So here's some of the uh, anatomic variants and some of their, uh, the incidence of them. Uh, they're relatively rare. Uh, and if you see one of these, I think you're particularly excited. Uh, but uh, these are the things you're looking for because they sort of dictate where you might place your filter. Um, so this is an example of something you might see. This is a circumaortic renal vein. Uh, it's essentially a renal vein that uh, has one origin that originates at one point in the low part of the cava and then kind of terminates in upper part of the cava. So the thought is here that if you place your filter kind of right in the middle here, thrombus could go through this, this pathway and go around the filter and you would not be protected. So if you see a circumaortic renal vein uh, on a CT, uh, you should place the filter below this. So the filter apex should be placed below everything uh, so the thrombus cannot get through this collateral pathway of the circumaortic renal vein. You could also place it in theory above, but you kind of don't want to place it right at the level of that guy because it could go around it. Uh, this is an example of a retro, a retro aortic vein. Um, so essentially in these patients, um, it has a renal vein that is incredibly low in the cava. Uh, so the idea is that, again, you want to place a filter below these renal veins. So in a low-lying renal vein, uh, 
the you can't really place at the level of the renal veins or you shouldn't place at the level of the renal vein. So in instances of a retroaortic or low renal vein, uh, you can sort of get around that by, again, you could place a super renal filter or placing filters in both uh, iliac veins. Sorry um, about that, I'm back now. No, hey, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Disaster averted. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, for duplicated cavas, uh, which I think you probably showed the slide already about how uncommon they are, like 1% of the population do you see these duplicated cavas. So you don't see them very often. So there's a few different management strategies for these. So you can either place um, one super renal filter, which is a decent option. Um, you still run the risk of clot theoretically going into the renal veins then just like with any other filter that you place. When you place a super renal filter, you are not protecting the kidneys uh, in theory from clot getting inside the renal veins. Um, so one option that uh, some people do often is uh, place a filter within both IVCs in the infrarenal uh, cava, so within the accessory IVC as well as the parent IVC. Um, the other option in theory is to coil off the uh, accessory IVC, which you rarely ever see anyone do that anymore, but most of the time you, you see us uh, putting in uh, filters in each cava and putting it in there. And it's kind of cool because then when it comes time to retrieve the filter, you get to retrieve two filters. So it's kind of fun. So uh, you're controlling the slides, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so here, here's an example, uh, some DSA venograms showing uh, a duplicated IVC. So this is the really the most, one of the most important things you have to remember to do is a really good cavagram and you want to make sure you reflux the contralateral iliac vein. Because if you don't see the contralateral iliac vein, like on this leftmost image, then you probably are dealing with a duplicated cava. So that's why we always encourage our fellows and residents when they're doing a cavagram to make sure you put the... Uh, flush catheter or the uh, the injection catheter that you're using at about the level of the bifurcation of the cava so that you, when you do your contrast injection, you're able to reflux a little bit of contrast into the contralateral iliac vein. Um, because again, if you do not see that, then you need to look for a potential duplicated cava, which generally requires getting access on the contralateral groin and coming up. You can catheterize usually sometimes through this cross pathway and sometimes deploy it all from one access, but um, sometimes you'll have to actually get, and a lot of the times you'll have to get access into the contralateral femoral vein. Okay, we'll go to the next. So uh, as Jeff alluded to earlier, yes, uh, mega cavas uh, are essentially a cava that's greater than 28 millimeters in diameter. Um, so you have a couple options in those cases. The bird's nest is one thing that generally most departments carry at least one bird's nest uh, filter uh, and keep one on the shelf just in the case, in the event that you need it. Um, so it's approved for much larger uh, cavas. You can go up to 35, sometimes even bigger than that uh, in theory. Um, but what most people do uh, is that they usually put a filter lower down within the cava. Either you can find a smaller portion of the cava that's closer to the uh, bifurcation, or you can put it in both iliac veins, put one filter in each iliac vein and, there, and thereby prevent uh, uh, further clot migration uh, from the legs into the, into the heart. So, um, so that's a definitely another option to consider is placing one filter in each iliac vein. So there's a variety of complications, which Jeff also alluded to earlier. So you can have migration of the filter. So the, the actual filter itself during deployment may migrate if you didn't measure your cava properly and say it's a mega cava and you deployed a smaller, lower profile filter, uh, and then the cava goes flying into the heart. And that's one of those, oh, crap moments uh, when you now have to go snaring and going after the filter that's now floating in the heart while the patient's potentially having an arrhythmia. Um, and you should always in those situations, you know, hedge your bets and do the safe thing and also get cardiothoracic surgery on board. You know, it, it, you have to kind of swallow your pride a little bit some, some of these times and, and uh, definitely get them involved sooner than later because filters are sharp and they can perforate the heart and they can potentially cause a pericardial effusion. You can perforate all kinds of things. So you may need a pericardial drain and you really want to get a lot of people and a lot of help on board if something like this happens and then start to go fishing because you can you can likely get it out. Um, uh, and I think there was a paper even published on removing filters from the heart, uh, actually probably by our, the group here at UCLA, but uh, it's, uh, it's another, another it's, uh, it's definitely a, one of those oh crap moments. Uh, filter fractures are very common. So you can, uh, you see these relatively frequently and this is been the topic of numerous lawsuits that are out there now 
and that you've probably heard about uh, uh, just from watching television because you see all these lawyers who are advertising as your filter fractured do you, have you had a thrombosis of your filter uh, give us a call um, so so filters uh, certain filters are maybe more prone to fracturing than others um, sometimes just the load bearing of having a filter sitting your, your cava sits right on the right on the spine so as it's sitting there for a long period of time you're moving around, bending around, in theory, in theory uh, the load on the filter may result in it fracturing. Um, these are things that still are continuing to be looked at. Um, the other things that can happen, you can get thrombosis of the vein you're accessing. You always want to make sure when you're picking your access point for how you're going to deploy the filter, whether you're coming from a groin approach or a IJ approach, that the vein you're accessing isn't already thrombosed. And usually having a good quality DVT scan uh, or, or just doing an ultrasound yourself prior to the procedure is, is prudent. Um, you can develop recurrent deep vein thrombosis and some some of these filters and the reason why we, we started all these filter registries and are really diligent about trying to get filters out is because filters can be thrombogenic themselves and result in cable thrombosis and and result in you know life limiting uh, limb swelling so those are things to keep an eye out for and you want to you want to make sure that you're diligent about getting your filters out um other things you, you can it, the filter legs can migrate to the heart etc Etc. So retrieval techniques, there's a variety of standard retrieval techniques that we use as well as some uh, more advanced techniques that are out there uh, that are described and that many of which have been published by Jeff himself mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so some of the standard kits that come, uh, there's the Cook kit, uh, there's, a, there's a Gunther Tulip retrieval set, there's basically a snare, it essentially consists of a snare and a, and a sheath that you can basically grab the hook of the filter, oversheath it, and then remove the filter in its entirety. So this is one of the examples of the prepackaged filter variety that comes. These these snares are nice because they come out at a right angle and it makes it much easier to grab the hook. Uh, you can make your own kit by just putting together a snare, a gooseneck snare, uh, and, a, and a sheath and oversheath these filters. Um, but uh, that's certainly another option to consider. Uh, especially if it's a relatively simple, straightforward filter and uh, the hook is straight and you don't have uh, any significant tilt and, and the filter doesn't look like it's embedded. Um, so oftentimes we usually look at either a plain film uh, that's, you know, you can look at an abdomen x-ray or a CT that the patient has had recently and evaluate and see whether the legs look like they're penetrating the wall, the hook looks like it's centered in the lumen, uh, those are all important things to look at when you're planning out your retrieval steps and especially in the setting of like a cable thrombosis you want to definitely order a ct venogram to evaluate the cava prior to attempting any sort of retrieval or uh, any advanced interventions so we'll go on to the next um this so, is just yeah, a, yeah this, the standard snare technique more or less yeah. around it too. yeah so you just pull the filter and then over. Yeah, so basically you grab the hook with the snare and then you oversheath it. So you don't really want to pull on the filter when you're taking the filter out. Oftentimes we end up having to right at the end, you have to do a little bit of tugging, but especially at the beginning, you don't want to tear the cava. So you don't want to pull up on your snare. What you're doing is just using the snare to grab and, and affix the hook. And then you're going to oversheath the filter to collapse it down all the way down to the legs. And sometimes at the end, you have to give it a little tug and a twist to get it to come out. Um, especially ones that are a little more embedded, but um, typically you want to try, especially with the standard filter removal, uh, you want to just try to oversheat that entirely and, and try to get it out that way. Um, so this hangman technique was uh, actually published by the UCLA guys, uh, some of my colleagues, Steve Key and Justin McWilliams and John Moriarty uh, and Ed Lee, I believe as well. Um, that uh, So it's a modification of the loop snare technique, which essentially involves you placing a, reverse curve recurvent catheter, such as a sauce or a Simmons or whatnot. And so the, the, the image on the left looks like it's the loop snare technique where you basically grab two legs is the goal. You have to grab a minimum of two legs because the problem is if you grab only one leg with your, um, with your sauce catheter, you're gonna just bend the leg and you won't actually be able to remove the filter. So you wanna make sure that your sauce catheter goes around at least two legs pass a wire through it and then pass a snare in parallel to inside your sheath and then grab that wire uh, to basically create a, your own snare with a long wire that comes out so you have two wires now sticking out the back end of your sheath if that makes sense so what you're doing is just to summarize it again you're putting a sauce omni recurvent catheter down into the cava forming it in the cava at, below the level of the filter and then 
using that SOS Omni catheter to hook two of the legs of the filter uh, and then pass a wire through your SOS Omni catheter. And then in parallel inside your sheath, you're passing a snare, grabbing the wire and pulling it through. So you can pass a glide wire through and then grab that wire with a snare, with a, uh, with a snare. And now you have two ends of the wire, both ends of the wire uh, outside of your sheath. And then you can now try to oversheath the filter. Um, the key when you're doing this, you want to mag up, make sure you're getting the actual hook and you're not uh, potentially scissoring your sheath and cutting your sheath uh, when you're advancing the sheath over the filter and you want to make sure the hook actually makes its way into it. So the modification of that, which works well for these embedded hooks, is to actually, instead of going between two legs, you're going between the filter neck and the IVC, which is on image B, uh, where they've, you know, you use the same technique where you put a uh, recurvant catheter through and get it beside the neck of the filter in the IVC and then pass a wire. And for these ones that have like fibrous caps, this technique works really well uh, to um, to get these embedded filters out uh, relatively easily with this simple technique. So, and the only other thing I'll quick say is like, like Ravi alluded to, uh, one important point is you should use a glide wire when you glide wire when you're doing this, uh, because I've certainly seen you shouldn't really use a woven wire. So I've seen uh, people attempt to do this with an Amplatz wire or a Benson wire. And it's just, it has like a solid core and then it's woven around that. And the thing is when you try to pull on this thing, uh, what you tend to do is just unfurl the wire and you can break the wire apart and everything. So the glide wire is basically like a solid core wire. Uh, so it can take a lot of force to remove these guys. Uh, so you want a glide that's like a single piece basically. Yeah, I can't reiterate that enough. You definitely want to make sure you're using a glide because, you know, an Amplatz or a Benson or something like that, it's going to get, get stuck in the legs. And then you're going to be in a situation where you can't even get the wire out. If, say, you can't oversheath it and you need to bail and try a different technique, your wire is going to be stuck in that filter and you won't be able to get it out. Um, so next slide. The, um, the endobronchial forceps is something that uh, Jeff published on actually using the 16 French sheath with the three millimeter endobronchial forceps while he was at Penn. Um, this technique has been popularized and this is like a very commonly used technique now for removing uh, IVC filters. So it requires placing a 16 French uh, 45 centimeter sheath and some people will place a coaxial 12 French sheath through that 16 French sheath. And then through that, you can now place the nine French uh, endobronchial, three millimeter endobronchial forceps and use that to grab these tip embedded filters or the filters that are significantly tilted. Because the nice thing about these forceps um, uh, is that you can, they're, they're the Limol, I forget the model number, whatever it is, 4172 or 30, I can't remember the exact model number, but they're Limol forceps. And these things you can bend on the end of it. Uh, you can put a little curve on the end of them so you can really get all around the cava and be able to grab a hook that's you know even way embedded in the wall um, and so these are these are uh, this is a really valuable tool when you're doing complex IVC filter retrieval uh, to be able to remove difficult uh, IVC filters and even permanent filters and I think Jeff and I have removed a number of greenfield filters using uh, endobronchial forceps the Simon Knight and all filters um, bird's nest filters, you often will have to use uh, forceps. You can use the hangman technique and some other techniques as well, but um, they do prove very valuable in, in many instances. When you have legs that have broken um, and that you need to go after an additional leg, it's very hard sometimes to use a snare to get the free end because oftentimes the free end is embedded in the wall, so you have to grab it from the side. So the nice thing about forceps is you don't have to have a free end per se. You can just grab the middle of it and then fold it up and pull it out through your sheet. So fractured legs, it's particularly useful. For the filter inversion technique, you can use uh, the forceps as well, basically to grab underneath the filter from a femoral approach and invert the filter with these night and all based filters. Um, so it's really an invaluable tool um, for removing complex filters. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Jeff. No, no I think that pretty much uh, summarizes it. It's basically yeah. like Robbie, Robbie said, uh, initially, for simple filters that haven't been in for very long, you can use the snare. Uh, but I think a lot of people's go-to for more complicated filters that ha are, have been in for a long time with long dwells is the uh, forceps because there can be certainly a learning curve with them. Uh, but once you learn to use them, uh, they can be very, very, very helpful. 
So the other thing that people sometimes use are the eczema laser sheets. The, the guys at Stanford have published a lot on this as well and uh, using the Spectronetics laser sheets, um, which basically uses laser energy to, to cut through tissue so that you can actually remove these tip embedded and uh, wall embedded filters uh, much more easily so that your sheath is reinforced. We oftentimes use braided sheets if you can, if it's available. Uh, it's hard to find larger size braided sheets, but these reinforced eczema laser sheets are great because uh, they have the laser energy in addition to being reinforced. So that's another technique. Um, so the long-term consequences of filters, we kind of alluded to these already. So the migration, the fracture due to loading forces on the filter, the fact that this can penetrate surrounding structures, so it can penetrate bowel, it can penetrate adjacent organs, it can uh, uh, potentially impinge on the spine and have legs that erode into the spine itself. And uh, it can, legs, depending on where the filter is placed, it can be, you can have a leg in the liver, uh, you can have a leg go into the kidney. Um, so these Filters can be notorious for causing problems and patients may present with pain or uh, we had a patient with uh, that Kyle did that had a bird's nest filter that the leg was penetrating a kidney and causing hematuria. Um, so uh, they can cause all kinds of crazy problems and you just have to look at look at your CT imaging and see where what it's actually doing uh, and uh, determine a plan for, for treating it. Um, the other main thing that can happen with these when you leave them in for too long, like we said earlier, is that you can get thrombosis of the filter, which usually necessitates um, either lysis or iliocable reconstruction, um, followed by ultimately filter removal. Uh, another thing we alluded to earlier are the legal ramifications of these filters, and there's a lot of lawsuits out there. Um, Jeff and I, and um, uh, one of the medical student or one of the residents now at the uh, University of Michigan, Casey Brannick, are working on this manuscript looking at the legal ramifications in IR, and um, that's something that uh, that definitely garners a lot more interest now, uh, given the climate of uh, the country currently. So those are things to also consider. Um, we talked about filter registries. Um, so uh, like the question earlier, if a patient no longer has a clinical indication for a filter, you need to remove that filter. If the patient can be anticoagulated and um, really has no need for that filter anymore, uh, it should come out. And it's really, really important. A lot of smaller places and smaller uh, practices uh, don't have filter registries set up, and it's uh, very, very important because otherwise these patients will go right under the radar and they'll have filters for years and years and years and then eventually present with either a filter fracture or, or cable thrombosis, and these are things that are preventable in theory. So it's these filter registries, I think, will do a lot for uh, for preventing these filter-associated complications such as you know, fracture and, and cable thrombosis, but but I think we'll still see them because not everyone's doing it. Once once it's universally adopted that, that filter registries need to be done everywhere, I think things will start to quiesce. Um, so again, the longer the dwell time, the greater the chance that uh, the patient will have a complication and the greater difficulty with removing these filters because they become more wall embedded. Um, so in the setting of thrombosis, the way we usually evaluate uh, patients um, is we start with uh, a simple anticoagulation and repeat a short-term follow-up study to see if uh, the, uh, the filter uh, can be possibly removed. So sometimes we may not even get a venogram, a CT venogram ahead of time. We might bring the patient back because they have a they have an IVC filter, and then we do the standard cavagram prior to removing it, and we see there's a little bit of clot inside the filter. And so we don't want to necessarily remove it. If it's a small bit of clot, sometimes it's okay. It'll come out when you take the filter out. But if you have a decent amount of clot or there, you see clot extending above the filter, you gotta, you gotta think twice again and, and you might wanna put the patient on some anticoagulation for a bit longer and maybe repeat the imaging with the CT venogram or bring them back for a repeat cavagram and possible removal. It's probably better to bring them back for a CT venogram so it's a non-invasive test. Um, so if there is complete thrombosis of the cava, we will oftentimes get, at least our practice in the past has been to get a CT venogram of the abdomen, pelvis, and the lower extremities. Uh, you wanna look at the filter also on that abdomen CT and any plain films that are there uh, to make sure that there's not any evidence of any issue with that filter, such as filter legs that are broken. Uh, and you wanna try to count them as best as you can. It can be hard to count on uh, just a plain radiograph or a, a CT. Uh, venogram, but uh, you can usually uh, count them reasonably well. It's a lot easier when you take magnified radiographs when you're in the IR suite to be able to account for everything. 
and do oblique views, et cetera. Um, if it's a temporary filter, uh, we often will consider removal of the filter depending on how long it's been in, depending on how it's oriented, et cetera, um, followed by reconstruction of the vena cava and iliac veins and the setting of thrombosis. Um, so oftentimes this might necess necessitate placing an additional filter above your existing filter if there's clot extending above it and you have to lyse the patient. We'll oftentimes place a suprarenal filter temporarily Lice the patient for any acute clot, and then um, and then uh, remove the filters, and then reconstruct the cavo with stents. Um, if the patient has a permanent filter, you can consider removing that filter in select instances if it looks like it's oriented in a safe way. Um, you have to you have to talk to the patient about it that it's not a technically a removable filter; it's a permanent filter. There's a risk of complications, risk of uh, ripping the cava, potentially risk of extravasation bleeding filtered leg migration, et cetera, and that those risks may be greater in the setting of removing a permanent filter, but sometimes you have to weigh those risks versus the benefit. If you can get the filter out, um, that's great because then you can reconstruct the cava without anything in your way, but what's another option is to basically just crush the stent, and it, um, Dave Williams and the group in Michigan had been uh, showing that, uh, and including Jeff Chick as well, uh, they had shown that this is also a safe um, method for uh, potentially reconstructing the CAPA in patients with indwelling permanent filters. So uh, that's definitely another option to consider. Quick quick question we had. Someone wanted to know what you what do you mean by the definition of small versus large clot and how you classify that? So yeah, so in terms of volume of clot, I, I kind of just, it's more of a gestalt type of thing and a subjective thing, and I'm sure it varies from person to person. I mean, if I see clot extending above the filter, I consider that to be a burden that's not going to be able to be, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider safely it, it to be safe to remove the filter at that time, and I would bring the patient back after anticoagulating for a period of time. Um, large burden clot, um, I think, is, 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 pretty self-explanatory if you have complete thrombosis of the cava or have a, you know, a, a significant amount of clot. But if you had a small focal clot, just a tiny little bit of filling defect in the cava, you might be okay removing it without, without any issue. But it's really uh, kind of operator dependent, I think, uh, as far as what your definition of small and large is. And I don't think there's a designated size, but it's more of a gestalt. All right. Thanks for explaining that. Um, so uh, for workup of possible removal in the setting of fracture, um, we usually get supine radiographs of the abdomen so that you can look and see what legs are fractured and what you're going to be going after. You may even need to get an x-ray of the chest as well to see if there's missing limbs in the chest and the pulmonary arteries. Uh, legs can also migrate into the heart, and those can be difficult to, to see on plain radiographs, so you have to often get times, oftentimes get gated CTs of the chest so that you can actually see the legs uh, in the heart if there's a leg that's unaccounted for. Um, so those are things you want to look at. You want to look for sequestered limbs, um, any cable penetration uh, from limbs as well, any legs that look like they're bent, because uh, those are things that are good to know ahead of time so that you're, you're planning appropriately, you have forceps available in the event of some issue, uh, and that you have the appropriate size sheets in place um, when you're doing your procedure. So oftentimes intraprocedurally, we'll get magnified views of the IVC filter. Uh, we'll do a spot image of the chest sometimes as well to make sure that uh, we don't see any limbs up there as well. So um, so these are all things that, uh, that you should keep in mind when you're, when you're removing filters uh, in the setting of a fracture. And the only uh, other thing there, I think that Ravi has alluded to here, is that if you see uh, legs or little fractured fragments that are in the heart or something or so forth, they certainly can be removed. Uh, they can be very difficult to remove, uh, as he alluded to earlier, have a discussion with cardiac surgery, and then uh, do extensive planning. So the folks at Penn have published several series on removing these uh, just using a snare, uh, using fluoroscopy and a, a snare, many views. Uh, Dave Williams and the folks at Michigan have used a bunch of really fancy techniques, electroanatomic mapping with cardiology and uh, really neat techniques to form, uh, make a shell of the heart and identify the fragments and then uh, retrieve them with, with using intracardiac echo guidance. Uh, both of those papers are in JVIR, and I think they're very interesting and sort of fascinating reads. Uh, so they can be uh, fragments of the filters or legs can be removed, uh, but again, you have to kind of 
uh, weigh or gauge the benefit and the risk. If it's a very distal fragment that's way out in a subsegmental uh, pulmonary artery branch, uh, it's maybe worthwhile just to leave it. If it's a frag uh, fragment that's embedded in the cardiac septum and there's no free end, uh, again, it may be beneficial just to leave it. Uh, so you got to kind of think uh, what is the best for the patient. That's a very good point. Um, so sure. So after we uh, remove the filters, uh, what exactly do you do? Uh, so do you need to do a cavagram? Do you not need to do a cavagram? Uh, so again, uh, after we take out a filter, if you use a uh, sort of standardized technique with a snare or one of the preset retrieval devices. Uh, the folks at Penn demonstrated that it's not necessary to do a cavagram after removing a simple filter. Uh, that because for the most part in their series, there were no significant complications in any of these patients. However, uh, if you use complex techniques, that's anything that doesn't really use this, that goes beyond the snare, uh, beyond the hangman technique. If you're using endobronchial forceps or you're using a laser, uh, it is prudent to do a cavagram afterwards. The whole idea is that these are a little more aggressive techniques. They are uh, could potentially be more injurious to the inferior vena cava. Uh, and it may result in something that you need to do something about. So the cavagram helps you identify the actual problem. And if you see something, uh, you can do something. Now, many folks become very uh, frightened or scared in general when removing some of these tough filters because they think there'll be uh, caval into susception or transection or disruption. And uh, while it's certainly possible, uh, it is relatively rare and depends on amount, the amount of force and traction. Uh, but if you think uh, for often, quite often, the inferior vena cava is a low flow system. Uh, so uh, don't panic if there's an injury, if there's extravasation, just be smart. Uh, have done a little bit of planning. Uh, the first thing is you can inflate a balloon inflate a balloon that's large enough diameter for the inferior vena cava, say somewhere between 18 and 24, uh, somewhere in that, and do balloon tamponade for a couple minutes, three to five minutes. And a lot of times this resolves in general. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, you can certainly do a prolonged balloon tamponade. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, you can uh, consider placing a stent graft. So there are a variety of stent grafts that could be placed. Uh, you can use an iliac limb stent graft, uh, which some folks have placed. But again, it's nothing to panic because you can take care of this. And in fact, uh, sometimes you even wonder if it's necessary. There are certain, certainly many documented cases of cable disruption, and afterwards there's no intervention at all, and uh, no balloon angioplasty, prolonged angioplasty, no uh, stenting. And the uh, system, the retroperitoneum, uh, just tends to contain itself and uh, the patient doesn't hemorrhage to death. Not that I'm act, uh, promoting doing nothing, but uh, it is a relatively low flow system. And overall, you don't need to be super worried about the potential complications. So uh, this is also something that people worry about is what if the legs of the inferior vena cava are going into the arteries or going into the aorta? Uh, so for a long period of time, people would do aortograms or arterial injections before they remove the filter. Uh, after the filter was removed, uh, they would do additional aortograms, multiplanar. Uh, and the folks at Penn uh, published a series that's in JVIR, and there's a companion series uh, by another group who's escaping uh, my my memory right now, it's in CVIR within the past couple months, and they basically showed uh, that if there is arterial penetration of the filter, uh, you don't need to be uh, particularly concerned uh, that there were no uh, substantial injuries or complications from removing filters uh, that had legs that went from the inferior vena cava into the aorta or other arterial structures. So now we'll just end quickly uh, with a couple of different cases, just showing 
uh, some techniques to remove these. Uh, this is really quick. And then if you guys have any other questions. Uh, so this is just a couple images here showing some of these spot magnification radiographs that uh, Ravi alluded to. Uh, so image A here uh, is just showing an optese. I believe uh, that's a hook at the bottom there. Um, and the whole issue here is that multiplanar spot radiographs, as Ravi discussed, are critical uh, before you remove filters because you want to identify, is there a fracture? Uh, how did things begin before you remove the filters? Because you need to, you don't want to be chasing your tail after you removed it and say, were all the legs there to begin with? Did I break something or did I not? And some of these things can be intravascular, some can be extravascular, some can be retrievable, some can, uh, the fragments, some of them can't be retrieved. So you want to know what you started with and then correlate that with when you remove the filter. Uh, B is what Ravi described again, the tip embedded filter. Uh, so this is uh, a filter that with time it's tilted and then the tip becomes grown in with neointimal hyperplasia to the wall and uh, it becomes difficult to remove. These are the kind of filters, tilted and embedded, that the complex techniques work well for. That's either the hangman technique, uh, the laser sheath, or the endobronchial forceps. Because the issue is, as you see in C and D, what happens is these long dwelling filters, if they've been in for a long time, or if they're tip embedded, even if you're able to get the hook, uh, you pull and pull and pull, and ultimately what happens is the hook just straightens, and you can't really get it out. So long dwelling filters that have been in for several months or that are tip embedded, uh, it's very helpful to just begin with some of the advanced techniques. This is just an example of the advanced techniques. Uh, we see a Gunther Tulip filter here with the endobronchial forceps that are grabbing it uh, in E. And then, as Ravi said earlier, don't pull the filter out because it drags the legs along the cava and can cause injury. But you just hold the tip of the filter and then oversheath it. Uh, either with a 16 French sheath or a telescoping device, a 16 and 12, or other devices, other larger devices for a uh, some of the permanent filters. Uh, then here's the post retrieval. Since this is a complex retrieval, uh, we do a post procedure cavagram. We see a little bit of cable spasm, uh, but nothing to worry about. And you can see these long dwelling fil these long dwelling uh, filters here. This is an argon option here in H. Uh, develop with time, uh, just this hyperplastic tissue or this neointimal hyperplasia, and uh, that's why they're hard to remove. You want to do some of these, Robert? Or you want me? me just sure. Yeah, yeah. So this is a 69-year-old guy with a history of. Uh, a permanent IVC filter. It's hard to see in that top left image, but you can see a CO2 venogram showing a stenosis there, and then uh, the Simon Nitinol filter there in, in image B, um, where uh, you see that on the arrow. Um, and uh, coming from an IJ approach, uh, they were able to successfully grab the hook of that filter and then oversheath it. Um, it looks like they're using a relatively larger sheath than this this one, uh, it, probably a 16 French sheath. To pull that into the into the uh, into the sheath using forceps and then successfully oversheathing it in D and fully removing the filter, followed by reconstructing the um, IVC with a with a wall stent or a palmaz stent in this case it looks like, uh, and then um, plastying the iliac vein there with a balloon um, to resolve that stenosis that you saw in A. And you can see on the final image F that there is uh, on a CO2 venogram that there's free flow through the IVC and through the iliac vein uh, with the patent cava. So the assignment night and all filters can be problematic. You can see this one was deployed pretty close to the bifurcation. So it's not really surprising that there was an issue with this causing uh, iliac vein issues and uh, cable occlusion at that level. So um, these are things that we can fix. Uh, again, uh, the other option would have been to stent the cava and stent that filter away if you couldn't get it out and, and stent into the iliac veins bilaterally, given its position so low in the cava. Um, so this is another case. Um, I think this was the 37-year-old man with uh, factor V Leiden, um, who was diagnosed with the left lower extremity DVT. Um, and he had... Uh, uh, a temporary IVC filter in his cava, which you can see in image A, uh, followed by us removing that filter using endobronchial forceps uh, from a right IJ approach through a 16 French sheath. Uh, 
Uh, and then you can see an image C performing IVIS post removal, which showed there was no cable extravasation. Uh, and in D, uh, you see ballooning of the cava with subsequent ilio cable reconstruction with wall stents, um, which was the kind of the traditional way we reconstructed cavas at, uh, at Michigan was uh, we used uh, a 20 by 55 IVC stent and then extended iliac stents uh, with 14 millimeter iliac uh, uh, stents that were long and extended those into the iliac veins bilaterally. And you can see on the final images in E and F that there's patent flow and free flow into the cava. So in uh, image A there on the next uh, slide, you can see that there's a what looks like a trapeze filter versus, yeah, this is a trapeze filter. And again, uh, like we'd said earlier, so the, these filters are notorious for causing cavial occlusion. And you can see uh, in, uh, even on the CT image, uh, it's a contrast enhanced study that there is complete occlusion of the cava. Uh, you might think that's mixing artifact, but it's real because you can see it on the uh, DSA images on B and C that there are numerous collateral veins uh, refilling and supplying and draining the lower extremities. And this was resulting in this patient having severe life limiting uh, limb swelling. Um, and uh, so in image D, um, you see a balloon being used to kind of push the filter off against uh, from the wall and then uh, coming from a right IJ as well as femoral vein approach, uh, grasping of the filter. So you usually need a colleague who's also experienced using the endobronchial forceps to help you with this or a very uh, a fellow that you trust. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and then you need to grab the filter from um, each direction and then oversheet that uh, again, uh, like Jeff had alluded to, sometimes we use the gore dry seal sheets in some of these cases because it's a little bit more uh, reinforced. You can you can you can get these more permanent filters out more easily by using a 20 French uh, gore dry seal. Um, but uh, that's something to also consider in, in these cases. So following removal of this filter, so you can see it was grasped from both directions in F. Uh, you can see on the post cavagram that there's uh, thrombus within the vena cava. Uh, and so this patient ended up getting um, chronic thrombus in the cava. This ended, patient ended up getting basically the crack and pave method with um, balloon plasty followed by um, IVIS followed by iliocable reconstruction with stents. And you can see in J and K, there is free flow through the iliac veins and into the IVC. So this patient who had complete thrombosis of the cava from this trapeze filter uh, successfully had it removed and also had it uh, had their cava reconstructed and, and their symptoms markedly improved uh, soon after this procedure was done. So I think that roughly brings us to the end here. Uh, so like we said, we try, there's a lot of information. You could go into depth in uh, uh, much more detail in all of these areas. Uh, but we talked a little bit about uh, the basics about filters, uh, their actual placement, and then finally uh, their retrieval. Uh, so we're happy to do any additional talks that any of you'd like in the future. Uh, if you ever wish, uh, you can certainly reach out to myself uh, or Ravi. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions or if you're interested in working on any projects with us in the future, uh, we're happy to have anyone involved. And I think we also really want to thank Jake because uh, Jake has been instrumental in uh, many, many, many projects uh, working with us. And I don't think we could ever thank him enough uh, for everything that he's done. Uh, so if you guys have any other questions, I think we're both Robbie and I are happy to answer them. And if not, uh, at least thanks for having us again. Anything? Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions right now, but I want to thank you guys too for an incredibly comprehensive talk on obviously a very broad and diverse topic that you could have talked for probably much longer even than this long talk too. So I wanna thank you both for taking time out of your day. I know you're both extremely busy too. So it's definitely valuable to hear both of your experiences regarding this topic as well. And if there are any questions, they're more than willing to take them. But if not, I wanna thank everyone for coming tonight. Sorry when we went a little bit over, but once again, thanks for coming. Thank you guys. Thanks again.